from the cap and trade because it is not somehow disappearing into a black hole in space, but to be made available to reduce the problems that average Americans uh, face on an ongoing basis and to be able to advance the vision, much of which he articulated I agree with. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate deeply your uh, scheduling this hearing and being able to deal with an important part of the climate change equation and the livability of our communities. As you uh, pointed out, uh, we're talking about a third of our greenhouse gas emissions. We're talking about where most Americans live, work, and recreate. We have opportunities here, and we will hear it from our witnesses, to be able to tie the pieces together in a way that reduces greenhouse gases, that inspires new economic activity, that provides more choices for Americans, uh, and leads us to a reduced carbon future. Uh, despite some of the political posturing uh, we have heard, I do believe at the end of the day, we are going to find that there is a very significant consensus that is emerging with the American public, with people in business, labor, environment, the professions, because there are opportunities and there's lots of low-hanging fruit. Indeed, we'll hear today about some things that's just talking about picking fruit up off the ground. And they have, in many cases, multiple benefits in terms of improving health to the individual, new economic activities, not just saving the planet. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, Mr. Chairman, and to be able to explore with you the big picture where we are looking at technology, economic development, strengthening the communities, solving multiple problems simultaneously. I am pleased that the President's budget blueprint provides an opportunity to finance it, to be able to encourage it, and to be able at the same time to provide support for businesses and American families in a way that they will actually be better off not suffering from the consequences of carbon pollution and climate change. Thank you, sir. Great. Great. We thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our witnesses. I also, as Mr. Sensenbrenner mentioned, has had to step out. I'm going to have to step downstairs to see our air conditioning and heating manufacturers that are uh, in a meeting down there on some similar subjects and then come back to join you. But I want to thank you for the hearing and do want to welcome all of you. And as you can hear on this panel, we will disagree about the issue of global warming and climate change and uh, the science that is involved there. But one of the things I think that we all agree on is that traffic congestion is a problem and that this is something that does need to be addressed. And I would say I'm one of those that says there's plenty that could be done and should be done uh, other than investing billions of dollars in a high-speed rail from uh, Los Angeles to Las Vegas. But there are other ways, low-cost ways, to address the situation. And there was a study by the Texas Transportation Institute that included some really um, common-sense approaches to this issue. Uh, freeway ramp metering, traffic signal coordination, incident management, high occupancy toll lanes. Taken together, these measures would reduce hundreds of millions of traffic hours, save billions of gallons of gas, and eliminate thousands of tons of emissions, all of which are important to us. So I think that investing highway money to correct inadequate bridges and increase road capacity coupled with a few simple improvements would significantly reduce emissions reduce fuel wasted and traffic congestion and move us in a more common sense approach along the way to solving the problem and with that i will yield back the balance of my time and look forward to the testimony okay. thank you mr chairman thank the general lady the chair recognizes the gentleman from colorado mr salazar i will thank you mr chairman and i will submit my full statement for the record but i just wanted to uh, uh, just briefly uh, let the panel know that I'm very interested in, in, um, in uh, energy independence and trying to figure out where we go from here. Uh, I'd like you to address um, the argument uh, that uh, a lot of people talk about whether we should do maybe a carbon tax instead of a cap and trade system, if you would. But I also wanted to commend the second panel, uh, John Deere. I'm a farmer by trade. I, I, I run nothing but green tractors and 
I want to commend you for your fuel efficiency um, efforts in, in that respect. And, and so thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Uh, we thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri. Uh, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, an abbreviated statement. I, I, I think uh, we are at a at an unusual moment, and if you um, deny global warming, th th that's that's fine. We're the, we're we're the only people on the planet with a sizable group still saying that uh, there's no uh, climate change. But uh, w we do have a, an unusual moment here, in that it. Uh, and that nobody can argue that putting uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is good, no matter what you believe. That just can't be good. I just, uh, I, I'm trying to find somebody who thinks that we need to uh, suck it up. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a good thing. But some good things are happening. We are at a 52-year high with transit ridership. And I think that is, is a good thing. I think it was brought on by two things. One, uh, when we had the tremendous rise in, 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 in uh, the barrel of, of oil, uh, which ran gasoline prices up, uh, and then uh, the economy uh, going down, people not, being, uh, not able to buy new cars, and so they, they've gone to, the, to transit. And so what I think we've got to do is figure out a way to uh, create uh, the, the most ecologically uh, and environmentally sen sensitive uh, system of mass transportation uh, on the planet. Any nation uh, who has a system superior to ours uh, creates embarrassment to us. And so I think uh, I'm interested in, in hearing your ideas and suggestions and look forward to your uh, comments. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. And now we'll move to our very distinguished witnesses. And our first witness this morning is Mr. Peter Varga, who is the CEO of the Interurban Transit Partnership. He is in charge of operating the urban transit system in Grand Rapids, Michigan, called the RAPID. Grand Rapids has become a leader in green buildings, mass transit, and other environmental <laughs> initiatives. Mr. Varga previously worked in transit management and safety uh, in uh, Muskegon, Michigan, and Santa Cruz, California. We welcome you, sir. Good morning. Sorry. Good, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey and uh, members of the Select Committee. This is really a, a great opportunity for me. Uh, we are a transit system that is quite successful in the United States in growing. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because I want to talk about how you can achieve 10 percent growth in transit, double the ridership in a decade. Um, we have, uh, we started the authority about nine years ago. Uh, we have expanded services over time. And we have, in fact, we're now transporting 9.1 million trips a year. And that's a double of the ridership that we had a decade ago. Um, the, the Grand Rapids region is quite well known for uh, its greening efforts and its green transportation. Uh, we are part of a community sustainability partnership with the cities, with the business people, and with the universities. 18% um, of all lead projects in the United States come from the Grand Rapids metro region. We have the first rectory, the first church, the first public museum, the first lead certified hospital, and we at the Rapid created the first lead certified public transit building in the United States. Uh, we never anticipated being first, uh, but we ended up being first. And being first, you can never change that, so we tried to herald it. Um, we're very well known for our sustainable practices. Um, I, I, in my testimony, I, t I talked to you about our central station project, which is LEED. Uh, we're going to start using the Americans uh, with American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to expand our wealthy operations center, our maintenance facility, and it's intended to be a LEED facility as well. Uh, in, because of our leadership in public transportation sustainable practices, we were designated by the Sierra Club in 2008 as a cool city along with Denver and Minneapolis. Um, in my testimony, I give you several examples of uh, 
public environmental benefits of a public transit <coughs> system, but I wanted to highlight one thing. Um, currently, more, there are more than 10 billion trips taken yearly on public transportation. With each additional billion trips taken, oil consumption can be reduced by 420 million gallons and our carbon footprint reduced by 3.7 million metric tons. Um, let's assume the 10 percent growth rate we've done in Grand Rapids in public transportation trips. The United States could save 141.9 million metric tons of carbon emissions annually, equal to 8 percent of total carbon emissions from transportation, and also save 15.2 billion gallons of fuel per year. Uh, I don't know how much we get from the Persian Gulf, but if it equals that, uh, that would be worth it, wouldn't it? Uh, I've, I've also put in some more statistics and in, 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 uh, information in my testimony talking about how individual actions impact the environment and how we can reduce carbon footprint. I'm not going to go through them, but I really wanted to talk to you about investment in public transit. Uh, with an average return of 6.1 percent in investment, we could create millions of American jobs, generate enormous public and private revenue, and make the country more economically and environmentally efficient. At a time when our country has been calling for stimulus, sustaining a 5.5 percent growth in public transportation could support 5.3 million jobs, and a 10 percent growth could support 8.9 million jobs. Um, so one of the things I did want to talk to you about is, and I, I, I have in my testimony how Grand Rapids specifically has benefited from its public transit system. The, the, the highlights I would like to say is we're starting to do a uh, BRT project uh, under very small starts. It's called a server line. And we're completing a, we've completed a streetcar feasibility study that shows that it's feasible in the downtown area and we're trying to create a public-private partnership to develop it because currently uh, under the New Starts program we are incapable of actually uh, pushing streetcar forwards. Um, we have some significantly improved transit services in the last decade and we've doubled our ridership as I said. The, the importance of this is that I do believe that the United States can double its ridership as well with the right kind of public investment. The primary reason why I'm here today is to give you the how can Congress support uh, local and regional public transit. Um, you could increase the availability of funds for fixed guideway projects like our proposed bus rapid transit project and other modes like light rail, commuter rail, and streetcar. You can make available funds for non-motorized options such as walking and bicycling. You can reduce the transportation cost for Americans through investment if you of could public summar, transportation. If you could summarize, please. I will sum it, sorry. Um, in sum, I have indicated in my testimony that there are several ways that federal climate and transportation legislation can affect positive change. And I encourage you to take each one of those measures that I've outlined and implement them because we don't have enough time as we're trying to save the earth. Thank you, Mr. Farger, Thank very you. much. Um, I'm going to allow the leading bicyclist advocate in the Congress to introduce our next witness. I wouldn't say that where Mr. Obistar could hear you, um, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is a pleasure today to have Andy Clark. Uh, Andy is the executive director of the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, last week, he just hosted people from 47 states, uh, several foreign countries, um, uh, over 600 advocates who were in and around the hill sporting our trademark bicycle pin. Uh, I first had an opportunity to become acquainted uh, with Mr. Clark when he was advising the Federal Highway Administration's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. A tireless advocate, extraordinarily knowledgeable, and we're lucky to have him here today. Welcome. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Blumenauer, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify before you this morning on the important role that bicycling can play in reducing oil dependence and global warming. Let me uh, return the favor and acknowledge and thank uh, Congressman Blumenauer for his leadership on bicycling and livable communities issues, for passage last year of the bicycle commuter tax provision, and for your leadership of the Congressional Bike Caucus, which I believe now boasts a majority of House members. Last week, uh, as you kicked off our ninth National Bike Summit, we heard from the head of Copenhagen's bicycle program. 
36% of trips are made by bicycle in this northern tier city of one million people. Copenhagen is hosting the next round of climate change talks in December, and we hope delegates from all over the world will see firsthand how a world-class city thrives with bicycling at its core. Uh, our summit participants were obviously wired by the sheer numbers of cyclists and the infrastructure that accommodates them. Yet the one critical lesson we learned is that Copenhagen was not always a bicycling paradise. In the 1970s, their city streets, their squares, their public spaces were overrun with cars. They chose a different path, have seen bicycle use increase dramatically, and now have their sights set on a 50% mode share for bicycling by 2015. Of course, there's a big difference between Copenhagen and US cities. I mention it because they are actually changing people's behavior, and I think that's the key. Bicycling is perhaps the ultimate zero emission transport mode. We all know that getting more people to ride or walk uh, instead of driving will help reduce emissions. The question is, will they actually do it? We have the answer here in the United States in many of our bicycle-friendly communities. For example, since 1991, Portland, Oregon has seen a 490% increase in bicycle traffic as their bikeway network has grown from 60 miles to 280 miles. In practical terms, that means that more than 16,000 cyclists now cross uh, Portland's downtown bridges every day instead of 2,500 in 1991. A green dividend has been calculated for Portland's integrated transport investment. The average Portlander drives four miles less per day than the, na than the national average, saving 2.9 billion miles of vehicle travel and keeping more than a billion dollars of money in the pockets of Portland residents. Other cities that I document in my testimony, such as New York, San Francisco, Cambridge, Minneapolis, and Washington, D.C., have seen phenomenal bicycle mode share increases in recent years because of the policies, programs, and funding they've invested to improve conditions for bicyclists. So how can the federal government support bicycle travel? Climate change legislation and the next transportation bill will direct hundreds of billions of dollars to transportation projects. And it's essential that a significant percentage of that investment completes bicycling, walking, and transit systems in our cities. Uh, a recent survey by the National Association of Realtors found that close to 90% of Americans agree with that approach. We must have a national complete streets policy to ensure that all those funds improve the safety and convenience of bicyclists, pedestrians, people with disabilities, transit users, and yes, even motorists. On that point, let me reiterate that bicycling, walking, and transit rise and fall together. I'm not pleading a special interest case today for bicycle enthusiasts. I'm suggesting that livable, sustainable communities are built on the ability of people to walk, ride a bike, and take transit for many of their daily needs, and that motorists and urban freight providers will benefit from having fewer cars on the road. Equally, I'm not suggesting that everyone suddenly become a 60-mile round-trip, lycra-clad bicycle commuter. Our focus must be on the 40% of trips in this country that are just two miles or less. 90% of those trips are today made by car. Those are the most polluting trips. These are the trips we must make easy and convenient to be made by bike. This is where the greatest potential lies to reduce climate emissions in the years ahead. Today's focus is obviously on climate change and oil use, and we support a greater emphasis on transit, more fuel efficient vehicles and hybrids, but I would be remiss if I did not remind the committee, um, as uh, my colleague uh, Congressman Blumenauer has done, that when you encourage bicycling and walking, you also help address the health, physical activity, air quality, congestion, and economic challenges faced by individuals, communities, and our nation. So thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark, very much. Our next witness is Chris Zimmerman. He is a member of the Arlington County Board uh, in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, he serves on the Board of Directives of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. I've uh, submitted a statement for the record, I think, to make best use of your time. I'll just sum up a few of the things and be happy to answer any questions uh, at the conclusion of uh, the statements. Uh, let me say first, uh, Arlington, Virginia, right here across the river, is a community with uh, a legacy of what is now called smart growth, although when my predecessor started it, uh, they didn't have that word, um, and uh, it wasn't so described. Uh, but in 2002, when the EPA gave out the first award for smart growth, the first award for overall excellence was given to Arlington for the success in planning and implementing the Roslyn Boston Metro Corridor, uh, which has now uh, become kind of a laboratory, uh, something people are coming to study, 
uh, to see uh, what you can do in what was not previously a real urban area, uh, but was kind of a declining inner ring suburb and has been revitalized uh, as a result over the last generation uh, and has now demonstrated that there's tremendous potential in a fairly high income growing area uh, to uh, move people to alternative transportation, uh, to reduce car, both car ownership and car usage and vehicle miles traveled, uh, to eliminate uh, drive only trips and, and uh, single car occupancy at an impressive rate, uh, and to do that by choice because people are uh, opting to live there. In fact, they have to pay a premium that has become actually our biggest concern. Uh, but we've also seen that on a countywide level, not only in the areas where uh, we have the tremendous investment represented by Metro Rail, uh, that it is possible uh, to get a more transit-oriented, pedestrian-oriented lifestyle, and that people want it. Uh, so throughout our county, we've been approaching this uh, in a similar fashion. Uh, we're a small jurisdiction geographically. We have about 200,000 people, but we're only 26 square miles, so you know we're comparatively dense. Our metro corridors are only about 10 percent of the land area of the county, and that's where we've concentrated most of this development. But even in the other areas, we're using things like uh, better bus service, uh, extensive bicycle network. We've been implementing bike lanes on streets as well as bike trails, uh, improving our sidewalk network. We have a complete streets approach that was described by uh, the preceding speaker uh, that has made it easier for people to get around, and in fact, people are choosing more and more uh, to walk, to ride bicycle, and so on. Um, just to give you a rough idea, uh, between 1996 and 2008, our county added 13,000 housing units, over 1,300 hotel rooms, 5.5 million square feet of office space, 1.3 million square feet of retail, over 23,000 residents and 11,000 workers. During that same period, traffic trends were basically flat, and transit ridership grew by 44%. Uh, there are many other ways you can measure this. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, if you simply look at who drives alone, who you know how people get to work, basically. Uh, if you look at how people get to work in the Washington metropolitan region, about three quarters or so uh, drive alone. Uh, in cor in uh, under the most recent survey we have, which was 2006, before the big run-up of gas prices, uh, a majority of our residents do not drive alone to work. Uh, only 47 percent of them do that. That's countywide, not just the metro carters. Whereas more than a quarter of them take the train, 12 percent take the bus, 6 uh, percent walk, 3 percent bike. And that all those numbers are up since just 2000. In just the course of this decade, we've been able to move more and more people. Again, they're doing it because they choose to do it, uh, because we've made it attractive and increasingly it's what people tell us they want to do. Uh, I will say uh, that the approach we've had is a comprehensive one. It centers first on land use and key decisions that have been made over the years and integrating transportation, but it includes other components as well, including a commitment to alternative fuels, which we have, for instance, in our bus system, which are CNG. Uh, to a green building policy. We had the first green building policy in this region going back 10 years ago now um, when not a lot of people knew what LEED was. Um, and, uh, and we have approached it in little ways too with things like um, car sharing. Uh, we have uh, car sharing available. I should say in this we, we somewhat copied Portland. Um, uh, we uh, straight out stole your orange poles that uh, you put on the street there. That seemed like a good idea. Um, <laughs> And so we have uh, zip cars now, we had flex car, and we'll invite any provider uh, at every one of our metro stations and at other places so that many uh, Arlingtonians make that their second car, including my family, instead of owning two cars. You know, you don't need to pay the insurance on it, and, but you have the second car when you need it. So there are a lot of little things you can do. We have a comprehensive transportation demand management uh, policy that relates to all new development. Uh, that promotes uh, transit usage by whether it's people working in an office building or uh, multifamily residential, and, and I could go on, but obviously time is limited. Let me uh, finally just say that I think there are a number of things the federal government could do that would be more helpful for this kind of policy uh, in localities around the region, uh, including making tra transit investments easier. Uh, obviously, we use more funding, but it's also what you have to do to go through the funding, and I will mention that outside our metro carters, one of the things we're trying to do is implement a streetcar like Portland's, and uh, there are many obstacles by the current state of, of federal policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Just so you know, Mr. Zimmerman, all the times that you mentioned Portland, just so this hearing is Mr. Blumenauer's idea. So, um, so <laughs> one more idea we have to run up the flagpole. And, you know, just uh, uh, and our final uh, 
witness is Mr. John Basel, who is the President and CEO of CalStart, which is a nonprofit organization based in California that works with public and private sectors to develop advanced transportation technologies. We welcome you, sir. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, Bozell. Bozell. Bozell, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate this Uh, truck technology for the last 15 years. Uh, we are a fuel and technology neutral organization, so we work with companies in working on biofuels, natural gas, hybrid fuel cells, etc. Uh, while we're regional sounding in name, we're actually uh, in this space uh, working nationally. Uh, we have an office in Denver, uh, and our chairman is Fred Hansen, the general manager of TriMet in Portland. Uh, what is possible and from the clean truck sector? Uh, I think the, uh, the California AB 32 climate change goals are possible uh, relative to this sector, meaning a 20 percent, uh, 15 percent, I'm sorry, 20 percent reduction below 1990 levels by 2020 and an 80 percent reduction below 1990 levels by 2050. I am a technology optimist. I do believe it's possible. Next slide, please. Actually, next slide after that. Um, we have... Uh, it, two key technologies that I think are ready, ready and available to go today are hybrid trucks. Uh, we've got uh, a variety of different technologies, plug-in, hybrid electric, uh, and hydraulic hybrid, all are viable. Uh, you, these are U.S. companies producing these uh, core technologies. Uh, we also have now three major manufacturers that are producing natural gas trucks, uh, and I think those are also ready to go. Uh, and, and, and show a way to reduce our dependence on oil. Next slide, please. Uh, a key uh, for natural gas, uh, a key fuel that we ought to just be developing right away uh, and doing what the Swedes are doing very effectively is biomethane. It's taking biomaterial, putting it in a digester, letting it cook for about three weeks, cleaning up, and then putting it into the pipeline or directly into vehicles. The Swedes are doing this very effectively, and they are in compliance with, with the Kyoto Accord. Uh, and it's, it's something that's there, low tech, ready to go. Uh, we should be doing it. Next slide. Uh, and this slide just shows that uh, the potential between biofuels and hybrids is something we really ought to take advantage of. Uh, Florida Power and Light has taken one of our hybrid trucks, is running a biodiesel 30 on it, and this truck today is getting a 70% reduction or displacement of oil. Uh, between the hybrid technology and the biodiesel. Uh, so it's something that's here and ready to go. I think there should be continued support of both bio and renewable diesel, as well as investment in the next generation green diesel technology, which companies like UOP, UOP and Amaris are developing. Next slide, please. I think there are going to be niche opportunities for uh, pure electric trucks. Uh, FedEx is deploying these uh, delivery vans in London, and I would say that one reason that they're doing it is because of the congestion pricing policy in London has given, uh, has reduced the cost of these trucks in, in the London area. Next slide, please. Um, I would say that, uh, uh, let me just make a few more comments on technology, is that uh, other viable approaches are fuel cells and hydrogen. I think they're a little more at the R&D phase and need additional investment in that area. Uh, and I would say that the uh, Federal Transit Administration has done a very good job of de helping develop that technology in buses. Uh, that, there was a very good robust program in the T-bill, last T-bill, and hopefully there will be a low-carbon bus R&D program in the next uh, T-bill. Uh, and that there are also opportunities to advance the core diesel technology. There's waste heat recovery, lighter weight materials, lots of different approaches that we can use to uh, make even uh, basic diesel technologies uh, more uh, viable and more efficient. So in, in summary, I just want to hit on some key policy recommendations. Uh, first of all, I think the uh, high price of oil that we saw last year was the mother of all policies. Uh, it, it really helped drive efficiency and improve the business case for all the alternatives. Um, it's clearly something in Europe and Japan, they have figured out how to send a consistent uh, price signal at the pump. Uh, on cap and trade, uh, uh, Congressman Salazar, to answer your question, uh, we do not see this having a material impact on demand uh, in the transportation sector. Uh, the price of carbon that we see at coming out of cap and trade may not, would not significantly affect the price at the pump. 
Uh, so we might see a 20 or 30 dollar or 20 or 30 cent price increase as a result of cap and trade, but we don't think it'll materially impact demand. However, if there are auction allowances, we would certainly hope that they could be used uh, for transportation measures. In the absence of a high price signal, I do think a, a new energy bill that would extend the existing tax credits for alternative fuel trucks and hybrid trucks is very important. Uh, on page six of my written testimony, we've laid out uh, specific rebates that ought to be provided for hybrid trucks based on the amount of uh, battery capabilities of each truck. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to thank the uh, U.S. Army uh, and the Department of Energy and the EPA for their programs in this area, and hopefully we can have an integrated approach uh, going forward. Uh, and and, and uh, one last point is that uh, I think T. Boone Pickens has done a good job of helping to educate the nation uh, about the uh, economic uh, problems associated with importing oil each year. Depending on the price of oil, uh, that price tag goes from 250 to 750 billion a year. Uh, we simply cannot keep affording that. We've got consumer debt that's out of control. We've got budget deficits that are out of control and our trade deficit. And energy, imported oil is a huge portion of that problem. And it's time to really address it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bozell, very much. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy and for uh, uh, scheduling this hearing. Um, I, I am struck, uh, Mr. Bozell, just talking about nuts and bolts things that are possible right now that are within the window of uh, uh, economic feasibility and with a little nudge might blossom to make a huge difference. And our ranking member did talk about the potential uh, with, uh, with trucking, and we look forward to working with you on those elements. Um, I have two uh, questions that I would like to put to the, the panel. Uh, one uh, just deals with um, where my friend, uh, the ranking member, left off. He talked about the pool of money that could potentially be generated, uh, two-thirds of a trillion dollars, perhaps double that, but then ignores what happens with the money. Uh, the president uh, envisions that significant amounts of money would be available to further incent energy efficiency, be available for rebates for families to cope with uh, challenges, and to be invested in other ways. And I just wonder if uh, you could uh, briefly touch on ways that the money that uh, may potentially be uh, generated could be spent in a way that could reduce the carbon footprint. For instance, Mr. Zimmerman, you talked about uh, struggling with uh, FTA to try and get them to administer, just administer existing law so you can build streetcars and other things. But what difference, what could you do with those resources to build on uh, the admirable record of success that you have? Congressman, uh, we, we would have a long list, but, uh, you know, to start, uh, things like uh, implementing, obviously, a streetcar is an example where a comparatively small investment can uh, yield tremendous results in promoting not just transit use, but the compact development pattern that you need that is really key to ultimately reducing you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, the, uh, the kind of smaller investments you can make, we did a transit center, for instance, for a few million dollars much of which, in fact, was federal grant money through the CMAQ program, uh, which uh, provided a transit nub in a place uh, called Sherlington, which is actually right off a major highway, which is an example of a compact development where you don't have a big, you know, uh, you don't have a train, but we're able in the area of about a quarter of a clover leaf to pack in uh, a community that's very desirable. People want to go to visit. There are now people living there, working there, restaurants, and we have a transit center that, ca that gets about 400 buses a day and carry several thousand people. That was a comparatively small investment which, you know, a federal grant helped make possible. Uh, there are all kinds of things like that you can do. And again, I would stress also not just the money, but how do you remove the obstacles that make it so difficult to get that you say, well, for a few million dollars, am I going to hold up my project for years in process? That's a tough question for us. Well, we want to come back to you in terms of reauthorization. Uh, I want to just touch briefly with our other uh, panelists, uh, Mr. Clark, Mr. Varga. Um, there's nobody that uh, puts a, a gun to the head of the people uh, in Arlington or Grand Rapids that forces them on transit, forces them uh, to walk to work, uh, to uh, bicycle. Uh, you've referenced in several ways the, the choices, making the choices more attractive 
uh, so that people can take advantage of them. We want to ref would you like to elaborate on that for a moment, Mr. Clark, in terms of choice um, for our citizens? Thank you. We, um, we often hear uh, that one of the biggest challenges facing uh, getting more people writing is Americans' love affair with their cars. Um, I believe Americans have a love affair with the quickest, cheapest, most convenient way of getting around, which we have done a very good job of making driving uh, recently. Um, a soon-to-be-published report comparing the U.S. and German uh, transport policies uh, shows that uh, Germans who love their cars and fast cars as much as anyone um, have a 41% mode share for biking, walking, and transit. They have the choices, they have the options, and they choose the easiest and most convenient way of getting around. In Copenhagen, again, the speaker at the National Bike Summit said that's the reason why Copenhagers ride their bikes. It's not because they're big environmentalist, it's not because it's in their genes, it's because uh, cycling is the easiest, quickest, most convenient way of getting around. Um, so I think that is, is part of the trick. And, and to uh, refer back to your uh, last question, I took the precaution of talking to Roger Geller at the City of Portland uh, yesterday, and he says that for um, about the equivalent cost of 800 feet of the I-5 uh, Columbia River Bridge uh, replacement project, they could uh, um, affect a, a Copenhagen-style transformation of, of Portland and achieve a significant mode shift and mode uh, change um, uh, over a, a, a 15 to 20 year period. Uh, that seems to me a wise and, and, and uh, a sensible use of, of resources that are there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, could you address the argument of should we just put a carbon tax on this and utilize that money to you know uh, develop new greener technologies and things like that, or should we do the cap and trade? And any of you can, can answer. If I can address this. You should do anything you can, whether it's cap and trade or carbon tax or taxing vehicle miles traveled, to get 250,000 cars off the road daily. O only 54% only of people have access to public transit. Um, you need to shift that, so you need to use some of those revenues from those sources to deal with the problems rather than the current revenues that are available to increase public transportation. So I would encourage all of you to look at different kind of climate change legislation that uses those mechanisms to fund these alternative sources of transportation. Which one would you prefer? I mean, a simple carbon tax? For to, emissions or? To, me, to me, a, a simple carbon tax and an assessment on vehicle miles traveled, a combination of those things, so you reduce also uh, the vehicle miles traveled. Anybody else? Uh, honestly, I, I think that any of these approaches would help in almost any combination. Uh, essentially, what Mr. Vargas said is, is the most important thing, that you know you have to make the incentives reflect the policy goals, and I think you have to make the cost, the social, the, the price we pay reflect the social cost. And, you know, anything from raising the gas tax, uh, you know, which would help a lot, uh, or something more sophisticated like a vehicle miles travel tax, which in some ways would be better but harder to do. Uh, but really, I think any of these things would be better than where we've been. And, you know, it's going to be a matter, obviously, of what you can make work on, you know, on many other levels. I, I wouldn't know how to pick, in terms of how it affects me at the local level, any of these things I think would be helpful in getting the right outcomes. Okay. Anyone else? I, I must say we, we uh, as an organization, don't have a particular preference. Uh, we do know that uh, as gas hit $4 a gallon last year, um, our phones were ringing off the hook. Our events were going, uh, were going crazy. In, in the Denver metro area, um, for example, their bike to work day grew from uh, a steady uh, 15,000 people uh, uh, a year to uh, over 20, 25,000, almost 25,000 people um, because people were focused on the price point. And clearly, uh, gas and, and price is a, is a big issue as, as to how people choose to travel. So whether that's the right mechanism, and we don't really have a, a horse in the race, whether it's cap and trade, whether it's a carbon tax, but the price of, of carbon certainly um, needs to be raised so we can pay for any of these alternatives. Mr. Boswell. I would just say that um, in general, I, I, I don't know that the different, a carbon tax is going to generate 
a higher price at the pump than a cap and trade program would. I think they end up when you see the proposals end up sort of having the same net impact. So in terms of demand, I don't know that there's a huge difference. Uh, I do think it's critical, you know, how the revenues get spent. Uh, I want to applaud Mr. Sensenbrenner for his bill, uh, talking about the need for additional funding for hybrid truck R&D. Uh, we've got to find a way to, to fund projects like that. Uh, and so I, I think that's critical. I will say that in California there is a proposal being put forth uh, to a commission that's looking on how to revamp the state's uh, funding system. And one of those is that, that there be a surcharge on, on gasoline and diesel, uh, recognizing that a cap and trade program would not have a big impact. Okay, and briefly, Mr. Bossel, um, you talked about innovative technologies uh, to create more efficiency, I believe, in some of the work you're doing. Are you um, aware of Sturman Industries? Um, in Colorado that uses an Apollo space mission uh, technology that has been able to increase internal combustion engine efficiencies by as much as 40 percent? We are quite aware of that, that very impressive firm, uh, Mr. Salazar. Uh, I think they've got some very interesting technology uh, and that's, they're, they're one of the reasons why I'm an optimist uh, about what can be done to really cut uh, oil use and, and carbon emissions from the truck sector because there are technical solutions out there. We just need the right kind of policies that encourage that they be used. Uh, and, and I'm afraid that $2 a gallon gasoline doesn't really do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the panelists. You know, uh, I'm s struck by the statement I heard earlier today that Americans love their cars fast, heavy, and uh, big, which is all very true. And, you know, in California, where I am from, uh, we are all very sensitive to um, in the environment being energy efficient. Uh, we've got the AB 32 law in the books, but I go to my local dealerships and they tell me that overnight the popularity of hybrids dropped like a rock and the big heavy SUVs were once again popular. We're trying to um, direct Detroit to build cleaner, more energy efficient cars and yet um, it's all about supply and demand and how do we address that? I'm not sure any in particular, but I'll start. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I think, again, it's a matter of what we're incentivizing. I think, well, there's some, undoubtedly some truth to the uh, you know, statement that this is what people want. I think that is overstated because we've essentially been subsidizing automobiles and penalizing other things. If you, you know, if you create communities in which the only way to get a, 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 quart, a quart of milk is to get in your car, then obviously you're going to create great preference in driving, especially for anybody who needs to be able to get a quart of milk. Um, on the other hand, I think the evidence indicates when you look particularly what's been happening in real estate over a period of time, people are opting for other things. They're paying a premium. Uh, you know, the biggest criticism that we get of my community is, gee, it's too expensive. Everybody would like to live there. Um, but, you know, that, that is telling you something. Uh, we don't have enough competition in this kind of thing. Uh, similarly, on just on the, you know, the, the, the straight-up question of, of cars versus other things, um, if we're making uh, automobile travel, uh, easier because parking is free everywhere, but you have to pay to ride transit. Well, you know, you're, you're clearly giving a disadvantage. Um, so I think that the overall incentive structure will have a big impact, and I think that that's implicit in the point you were making, that we, we saw a tremendous change in market demand based on a, a fluctuation in a short period of time in the price of fuel. So stabilizing the price of fuel at a more realistic level, which would frankly be higher, reflecting the other impacts of its consumption, would have uh, would go a long way, I think, to generating the right demand and allowing both manufacturers to know not only of automobiles but of other products uh, to know that it made sense to invest in them and bring the return. <clears throat> and over time, I, you know, I think again you'd see the behavior change as well. And again, I don't know the best way to do that. The simple, I mean, if if all you did was tax gasoline at a more sensible level and stabilize the price at a higher level. Um, you, you'd have tremendous effect. Uh, many of these other things would work too. Some of them might, in, you know, might work better. Uh, but somehow you need a policy that, that does that. Um, otherwise, I think we continue to get into this fluctuation that you were describing. 
and the complaint from people trying to do either policy at the local level or manufacturing goods saying, you know, can't count on what's going to happen next. What I would like to say is that you should really incentivize public transportation, bicycling, walking versus using your car where you're putting your investment. If you're putting your investment into making it easier for people to buy cars, use cars, then you're not creating the kind of land use patterns that really help people move to communities where they can walk easily, take a bicycle, live in the neighborhood, use public transit, get rid of their car. It takes an adjustment. It took me an adjustment to get used to my hybrid car. You know, but my other car is the bus. And, you know, we have to think about what's important. What's important is to save the earth. I mean, there's something, there were two shows last night that talked about global warming like we're still debating it. Yet we're dumping sand on the beaches nearby here because the sand is being eroded because of global warming. We're spending money the wrong way. We should be spending our money incentivizing a change in behavior. And you have to change behavior. Maybe me just add to that and say that uh, I do think that um, the way we do our planning can really be uh, improved. And, and in California, there's, there has been new legislation passed, SB 375, that will require metropolitan planning organizations to help come up with sort of a carbon uh, footprint analysis and plan to reduce uh, emissions and vehicle mile traveled. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Blumenauer is considering uh, legislation along these lines that, that might also be helpful at a national level. And then could, if we start building in requirements that we reduce uh, emissions through better planning, uh, lower carbon trucks, and through the goods movement industry, then I think uh, you know, we can see some progress. Uh, let me just um, applaud that because it reminds me a lot of the housing element requirements in California that by virtue of requiring the housing element and having a percentage of low-income housing, communities were forced to, to develop those, um, those percentages. So it sounds like a good plan, Congressman. We'll talk. Thank you. Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, I just wonder, going forward, uh, looking at our transportation funding, you know, we have a transportation bill coming up. We have all these great ideas for giving Americans multiple transportation choices, which I really think this is all about, between single occupancy cars, bikes, buses, trains, sidewalks, you name it. How should we think about the division of our financial resources between those? Has this group thought about what the target ought to be for modes that have the capacity to be safe, reliable, and reduce you know, our impact on the environment? Should there be a target in that regard regarding the disposition of our resources? And how would that target relate to where we are right now? Um, I can't say that I've uh, run this by my colleagues on the panel here, but um, speaking for the, um, the America Bikes Coalition, which is a coalition of the national bicycling organizations, uh, the numbers that we are um, uh, commonly uh, using are that um, currently 13% uh, of fatalities uh, in our, on our nation's roads are um, bicyclists and pedestrians. About 10% of trips are made by foot and by bicycle. And we get currently between one and on a good day, one and a half percent of federal transportation funds um, being spent on those modes, uh, significantly less if you look just at the safety funds. So there's clearly an imbalance that we would like to see uh, rectified. Our goal uh, in, that we'd like to see in this reauthorization is to find a mechanism to, uh, to double the percentage of trips that are made by foot and by bike to get us up to the levels enjoyed by many of our economic competitors uh, around the world. Uh, and to, uh, to do that through everything from uh, Safe Routes to Schools programs, which get people thinking the right way at an early age, um, right the way through complete streets <coughs> policies, which are supported by um, AARP and the realtors and a, a variety of other uh, groups uh, along those lines. So um, that's the kind of uh, uh, balance that we'd like to see uh, more of in, in the next transportation bill. When you consider that uh, something like 60 percent of uh, transportation emissions are generated by passenger vehicles, and that's about a fifth of total U.S. Uh, greenhouse, or at least CO2 emissions, as I understand it, uh, I think there is an argument for kind of targeting uh, other modes and trying to promote them. But I'd say it's not only a matter of, of funding those, 
um, but of how policy uh, overall winds up uh, incentivizing what you do. So, uh, for instance, you know, when you have tax policy that is um, promoting free parking, um, that's a factor. Uh, but you also have to consider how you give out whatever money you give out so that if, if you had a policy that were rewarding the kinds of investments, not only in the modes you want, but also rewarding the supportive policies that, for instance, we administer at local level. I mean, most land use policy is local policy. Some states, you know, govern it, but mostly it's, it's the most local thing done. And yet, in what you need to do if you want to get a project funded, whether it's a road, transit project, or any of it, doesn't really depend on a, a whole lot of that. And the, the practices in the past have tended to you know, tended to be independent of that. In fact, they've tended to promote exactly the wrong kind of thing. So, you know, if somehow you were rewarded for the fact that you're investing in existing commercial areas, that you're, um, you know, that you have uh, land use policies that promote compact development and transit orientation, not just transit adjacency, rather than rewarding people because they're going faster over longer distances solely, I think that that could have a really uh, big So, impact. let me start at the beginning. If, if you don't have a goal, you don't get there. I guess the question is, should we have a goal for our transportation policy and appropriations coming up here this year? Yes. Of a I would given, say yes. Of a yes. Everybody's saying yes. Let me ask the question first. <laughs> 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 this is a great panel. Um, of a given, you know, of a given CO2 emissions per mile traveled in America. Everybody's saying yes to that, I assume. Is that I'd say yes, but and the, my only concern would be when you try to set the goal nationally, you have to set in a way that doesn't wind up being too low, um, but on the other hand takes account of those areas that have already done some of the right things and how do you not punish them for having done some. I mean, it's, I don't think it's an easy thing to, or a simple thing to do, but with that qualification, then I think, yeah, you should set targets. Quick question. Uh, I've been talking to uh, the Better Place folks about establishing an electric infrastructure for charging electric cars. Just got a BlackBerry this morning about Spain moving in a very serious way to provide a public infrastructure for charging electric cars. Uh, we're now looking at some permitting issue up in the state of Washington to, to allow that to move forward. Uh, some people have expressed concern about that uh, uh, ending up being a monopoly of one company if they come in and provide all this infrastructure. Um, I think that can be handled, but I just wonder if you have any insights on how we provide this electric charging infrastructure. Uh, that's a very timely question. Uh, I'd say, first of all, that I'm very excited about the number of electric vehicles or plug-in vehicles coming to the market. Uh, there are plug-in hybrids. There are pure electric vehicles that are, are coming. Uh, I think one of the real beauties uh, of those cars is that people will be able to recharge at, at their home. And, and people are finally looking at these cars as uh, more urban uh, city cars and not trying to make them do the exact same thing that your, your gasoline car could do. Uh, so I think to a certain extent, uh, the initial rollout of these vehicles will not be dependent on having a public infrastructure. And I think surveys show that people love to be able to charge at home. Uh, but I do think that as we roll out this infrastructure, it is very important that there be a consensus within the industry, within utilities, car manufacturers, that we don't get into a uh, beta versus VHS kind of debate. And, and we did that in the 90s, and we ended up with two different types of charging plugs, and, and now we still have those out there. And those same plugs are not relevant to the next generation of plug-in vehicles. Well, the, good, the good news is that the wiring's there, but... Um, Chairman's permission, just one quick question. I mean, should we try to strive for some uniformity in a charging system? Yes, yes, we, we definitely should. And, and I think that's a great role for government to really s drive industry and get people to cooperate and talk to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, I represent rural America, I represent South Dakota, and I want to make sure that as we move toward a greener transportation system that our needs and opportunities aren't left out of the discussion. Uh, our transit systems certainly may not have developed quite as far as urban uh, transit systems to date, but there are certainly challenges to overcome, but opportunities as well. Uh, the miles that we put on vans and buses 
uh, as most transit fleets offer services hundreds of miles away from base communities uh, is something that needs to be addressed. Most towns in South Dakota have to compete with cities for the incentive grants offered by the Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highway Administration to help upgrade to greener and more fuel efficient vehicles. But many folks that I hear from in South Dakota are excited to take part. Uh, in the new green transit system and are certainly doing their part to reduce emissions, utilize homegrown clean biofuels and become more energy efficient. Moreover, many of our towns face the unique opportunity to be able to build up green fuel efficient fleets from the very beginning. For example, River City's transit in the state's capital city of Pierre we pronounce it Pierre, not yeah. Pierre in South Dakota, as you know, uh, is at the forefront uh, of our state in utilizing E85 vehicles and other fuel efficient vans and buses. They're also working to purchase the first hybrid van in the state to be able to use, be used for public transit. And they're excited to see if hybrid vehicles are a workable option uh, in our state. Now, River Cities Transit is also working closely with many of the nine sovereign tribes in South Dakota to help them build up their fleets with similar vehicles and encouraging their leaders to make smart decisions now that will save both money and reduce emissions. So I guess I'm wondering to what extent your organizations or other organizations that you're familiar with have been reaching out to rural communities to share with them strategies for developing green transportation systems, as well as anything that you're aware of in terms of organizations or um, initiatives to reach out to Native American tribes. Um, I can talk a little bit about that. The, the issue here is that, um, let's look at Europe. Uh, in Europe, you have rural communities, you have urban communities, yet you have an integrated transportation system. Um, and using alternative fuel vehicles um, in rural areas is really to an advantage. But they have to connect to some place so they can go some place so they can go some place so they don't have to drive across the country to get somewhere. What we don't have is an integrated transportation system in this country that allows people that choice. You take a smaller trip with a van or a bus or a car that's alternative fuel to some train station so you can get to a place, so you can go to the city and move around really easily. You really have to focus on investment across the country that gets you there. In rural areas, true, there has to be some increased focus of, of uh, providing that uh, support for transit to do that. And then in the cities, you have to make sure that there's more fixed guideway systems in there so when you get there, you can move around. So you're not stuck thinking, I'm leaving here. I have to use my car to get to Chicago. I appreciate your point since South Dakota does not uh, have Amtrak service. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, want to say, uh, Congresswoman, that uh, one of the uh, programs we're really working hard to develop is a, a fuel called biomethane. Uh, which is uh, t taken from uh, biomass, and, and it can be the, the Swedes. Uh, I'm not sure if you were here earlier, but then when I mentioned it, but the Swedes are developing this fuel. Uh, it's a renewable form of methane, just like the, the natural gas that we, we use today. Uh, and I think this is, there is a tremendous opportunity for rural communities, uh, particularly agricultural industries, to take advantage of, of that as a local fuel source. Uh, and we would be very interested in, in working with the groups in your community to, uh, in your state, to help develop that fuel. Um, if I may, four, three, uh, four very quick points. Number one, one of our um, uh, most uh, favorite bicycle friendly communities in the U.S. is the Tucson area. And um, when they applied for a designation as a bicycle friendly community in 2006, um, they, uh, they got the uh, uh, gold designation and uh, included in their application uh, two Indian nations, the city, the county, uh, the state DOT, the regional uh, MPO, um, and it was a truly regional application and was one of the first times that that really had happened and all those different parties had, had worked together to um, put together uh, a, a program like that. So uh, we're beginning to um, be able to say yes, we can, um, we can answer that question in, in the affirmative. Second thing I'd say is that in uh, many rural communities there, an ideal size and setup, perhaps often with the exception of the U.S. highway that, or a state highway that might run through the middle of them and be a significant barrier, they're an ideal size and, and uh, uh, makeup for bicycling and walking, and, and uh, we, sh we should not forget uh, rural communities and small towns in the uh, application of, uh, of enhancement and other funds um, to, to make them more bicycle friendly. And there are perfect examples like the Mickelson Trail.
rail, uh, which are uh, not only great transportation corridors, but a huge recreation uh, opportunity. And studies from uh, the province of Quebec to uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina to uh, the city of Portland show the uh, enormous economic impact of cycling on uh, a local economy and the national economy. And some of that is uh, in my uh, written testimony. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And uh, just for the record, the Mickelson Trail is through the Black Hills of South Dakota, and very popular recreation, uh, named after our late uh, Governor George Mickelson of South Dakota. Um, I, I deeply appreciate your uh, bringing back to the notion of how we're going to meet the needs of um, all of America. And I've enjoyed our conversations about rural and small town. Um, and the point you raise is one that I hope we can pursue with the organizations that are represented here about scale of community that we don't, we don't count some people out just because uh, there are artificial formulas or constructs uh, where they don't qualify. And the other thing is just the capacity that there are many communities that you represent where there may not be the institutional support to be able to navigate these things and being able to make them friendly is something that um, I, I appreciate your, your uh, continually bringing us back to it. Um, uh, dramatic lack of attention to Native Americans uh, where uh, transit uh, is awkward, but if you don't drive, you're in trouble and uh, the application of technology. And I look forward to continuing that with you and um, uh, in subsequent efforts, because I think this is, is an, a missing ingredient that doesn't get the attention, and I appreciate your, your laser-like focus. Well, thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. I, too, appreciate your genuine interest in addressing the infrastructure needs of communities large and small in every region of the country, uh, particularly throughout the Great Plains region, as we've discussed, uh, both in farming and ranching communities and Native American communities, uh, and not just developing new infrastructure, but maintaining existing infrastructure. Uh, with this focus on transportation today, I appreciate your sentiment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our chairman uh, has a tradition of uh, giving each witness uh, 49 seconds uh, to summarize their thought if there's something they want to punctuate or something that was left off. Or, uh, and uh, we just give each of you uh, a, a quick minute to wrap up uh, as you see fit. Mr. Varga? Uh, thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, has not been mentioned much is, is streamlining the whole federal process of getting transportation dollars. Uh, it's, it's taking us nine years to build a BRT project that's $40 million in cost. How civilized is that? Uh, the other thing is I think that land use patterns must be incentivized, tied to public transportation, tried to, tied to all these forms of transportation. And, and it's only using those energy efficient land use patterns tied to transportation that's going to change what we're trying to achieve here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Clark? Um, I would go back to the, uh, the one statistic that I think is perhaps the most surprising, which even I have to keep checking to make sure I'm not making up, and that's that 40 percent of all the trips in U.S. metropolitan areas are two miles or less. Those are the trips that we can have some impact over. And I would uh, close by saying that uh, um, you may uh, recall that uh, in 1985, the World Bank famously issued a report on transport in China that failed to mention the word bicycle. I would hate to come back 25 years from now and look at climate change legislation and a transportation bill uh, passed in this Congress that fails to really adequately address uh, bicycling and walking and transit. I think you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oberstar will make sure of that. Zimmerman. Thank you. I'd just like to mention, uh, I guess, quickly three things. Um, the first, what Mr. Varga said, uh, tying transportation uh, to land use, support of land use policies, I think is uh, key. Uh, funding the right things. Uh, right now, only about 20 percent, I think, of federal funding is, uh, is uh, transit. Um, and making it easier to get that uh, is key. Uh, and then adjusting the other policies that, you know, don't really make it uh, possible to do. It's not only, you know, it's the it's not only the how hard it is to get the grant, but it's also what's rewarded, and taking into account things like housing and how they relate, linking housing costs as in related to overall benefits and that kind of thing, I think will make the biggest impact and ultimately allowing federal policy to promote the kind of behavior that you're looking to see at the local level that will really have an impact in this area. Super. Thank you.
So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, three last comments. Uh, one is that uh, I want to just emphasize that I think transit has been an early adopter of clean, low-carbon, uh, heavy-duty vehicle technology, and it often gets tested out and proved there in transit uh, because of the public funding of transit. Then it gets adopted later on by the trucking industry and then later on by the commercial construction equipment. And particularly as we look at greening construction, highway construction, building construction, uh, there's a real opportunity to develop a, a lower carbon off-road vehicles, construction equipment to do that. But it starts, I think, with sort of a bus program, believe it or not. Uh, secondly is under the uh, next T-bill, we would love to see, much like we've had the uh, Safe Routes to School, a low-carbon route to market uh, for, uh, for trucks. The demonstration program where we take a corridor and we say this is going to be a demonstration low-carbon uh, uh, goods movement corridor. And then lastly is I think there's a huge opportunity if we do invest in this sector to be a world leader in terms of heavy-duty green uh, vehicle technology. Uh, we can be exporting this product. Uh, in, in many countries, the biggest, fastest growing countries, 50% of their vehicle population are commercial trucks and buses. Uh, they don't have the kind of per capita vehicle ownership that we have in this country. So if we develop this product, we get it down to a, a decent price, it can become an export uh, product and can be a global solution. Super. Thank you very much for uh, helping us build this record. Um, we're going to have, uh, and we'll move to our second panel here. Um, we're going to have people dropping in and out, and as you've noticed, this is broadcast, so there are people that are actually monitoring, uh, so we want to just drive ahead until we have uh, and not wait for the chairman. So we'll have our, uh, ask our second uh, panel to come forward, uh, because uh, the second part of the equation that we are concerned with uh, deals with how we put these pieces together. Uh, there, are so, there are so many elements that are involved uh, with our built environment and the infrastructure that uh, are uh, uh, profoundly affected by uh, the, uh, the, the carbon input uh, of how we build it, how we manage it, what we build it from. We are uh, pleased to uh, have on our second panel uh, representatives that speak to construction materials, uh, people who can talk about how we actually, uh, uh, the practices in, in, uh, in affecting the building, and uh, last but not least, uh, some of the equipment that is used by the materials and the people who, who build it. Our first witness uh, will be Erica Guerrero a manager of government affairs and corporate social responsibility at uh, Holcim uh, International, a leading global manufacturer of construction materials. She's here today from Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, the chairman's home district, uh, has worked on corporate sustainable development strategies and worked throughout North and South America. Uh, we welcome you here today and uh, invite you to proceed uh, as you're ready. Well, thank you, and uh, I guess I, I'll have a, a little bit of a different accent from Massachusetts, so bear with me with that, please. Yeah, we need um, an in, we need, often need an interpreter with our chairman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me here. It's a privilege to appear before you today. Um, as you said, I'm responsible for government affairs and corporate social responsibility of Holcim. We are one of the world's largest producers of cement, and uh, the essential ingredient in concrete. I want to highlight the need for increasing the use of concrete to reduce the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Innovation is key to reducing CO2. Holcim invests heavily in research and development with a focus on optimizing our processes and creating products that provide better performance with fewer natural resources. Holcim is committed to reduce its net CO2 emission per ton of cement. We have invested more than $2 billion over the last five years upgrading and expanding our facilities in the United States. I commend you <clears throat> for the leadership in promoting innovative solutions to reduce the environmental impact of infrastructure construction. Headquartered in Waltham, Massachusetts, <clears throat> we are the leader in the US cement industry serving 44 states. 
For the last three consecutive years, we have been recognized as the leader of the industry by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Holsem Limited is a global company with operations in 70 countries, and we're engaged in the European emission trading system. We are working with the subcommittee as part of the Energy Intensive Manufacturer Group that appeared before um, this uh, committee yesterday at yesterday's uh, hearing. Concrete is the foundation of any modern society, and it's the second most used commodity in the world after water. Cement is a critical component of concrete, and when combined with water and aggregates, becomes the glue that binds the whole mixture together. Cement gives concrete its strength and durability. Nearly 50% of our product has an end use in the public sector, in roads, airports, bridges, hospitals, and schools. Cement is an energy intensive material to manufacture. However, it only constitutes approximately 15% of the concrete's volume. The first step in the manufacturing process of cement is heating the limestone at extremely high temperatures, up to 2,000 degrees, which produces what we call clinker. And that's, I'm introducing a new term here. And, um, <clears throat> this is the energy intensive part of manufacturing cement, where 90% of our greenhouse gas, gases are generated. In, ver in very general terms, there is a ton of CO2 emitted for nearly every ton of cement produced. However, 50% of those emissions are the result of a chemical reaction in the process, which are commonly referred as process emissions. Another 40% are the result of the fuel combustion to maintain those high temperatures. And the remaining 10% is, is attributed to electricity use and transport. As a result, the cement sector accounts for 5% of global CO2 emissions. And it is forecast that the demand for the product will increase over the next 30 years. It, it, goes, it grows with the population. Holcim has identified three primary areas of opportunity to drive the reduction of greenhouse gases in the cement production. First, capital investment, technology, and process innovation can reduce the energy consumption of our facilities. Second, the use of waste-derived fuels, like scrap tires, like biomass, like plastics, can reduce the CO2 intensity by replacing fossil fuels like coal. And third, the use of other industries by products as supplemental cementitious material, second term, SEMs, can reduce the clinker content in cement. I would like to focus on this last opportunity. As I explained, the production of clinker is a major source of CO2 emissions from cement manufacturing. We should look for ways to reduce the amount of clinker in the mix. Unfortunately, we lag behind many countries by requiring inflexible recipes for cement instead of performance-based standards that adapt the needs of a project, like in the rest of the world. Many projects can be done with a lower carbon footprint if performance-based standards are accepted. However, acceptance does not necessarily translate into use, especially when it comes to infrastructure projects. Holcim encourages the development of a unified performance-based specification for cement with support from ASTM and AASHTO that ensures that cement produced in the United States meets all technical requirements while affording producers the opportunity to innovate and develop new products. We believe that in order to be effective <coughs> in re the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions through the consumption of blended cements, national acceptance of performance-based standards and a preference for the use of these products needs to be led by federal and state governments. I sincerely thank you for your time and I again appreciate this opportunity to speak about the linkages between infrastructure development and global challenges of climate change. Well, thank you. We appreciate your adding your voice. It's something I don't think is appreciated in this broader conversation, and I appreciate your being part of our hearing today. And Mr. Weaver, what do you do with all this cement? We uh, we are concrete pavers, so that yes, plays I should, right into. I guess I should introduce Mr. Weaver as the Highway Division Chairman at. Uh, the Associated General Contractors. As we all know, AGC is a leading advocate for infrastructure investment uh, at, the, uh, at the federal level and I would say at the state and local level as well. Uh, Mr. Weaver is Vice President of Weaver Bailey Contractors of El Paso, Arkansas, and we deeply appreciate your joining us today and the leadership that AGC has been uh, exhibiting on so many of these interrelated problems. Thank you, and I do follow Scott Williams uh, from, from your district because he was chairman last year, and uh, I will have another accent that you haven't heard today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
Uh, I'll skip my first paragraph. Uh, AGC is the oldest construction association in the United States representing contractors that build all forms of infrastructure. Construction is the delivery system for a cleaner, healthier, and safer environment. Studies show that improving our highway transportation infrastructure to allow vehicles to move freely through existing bottlenecks will significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Also increasing transit ridership, which we have transit members that build transit, uh, by improving existing systems and constructing new ones in congested urban areas will also have positive impacts on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And as important as providing these needed infrastructure improvements is the way these improvements are made. The, our industry has a long history of developing construction techniques and practices that enhance the environment. The federal government can, insist, can assist in these practices by offering appropriate incentives, but it's important that we learn from the lessons of the past and not try to mandate one-size-fits-all solutions. In many cases, recycling and reuse of construction debris is cost-effective and would decrease the amount of waste sent to landfills, may reduce transportation costs, lower energy use, and thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions. My own company, Weaver Bailey Contractors, on three jobs in urban Little Rock area, recycled over 500,000 square yards of original interstate concrete pavement into 276,000 tons of base course that was put back underneath the highways and reused. Uh, we estimate that that saved 18,400 loads of virgin materials that would have been hauled to the job site from a quarry up to 30 miles away, which uh, caused a savings of 100,000 gallons of diesel fuel, and it lowered the emissions caused by the job. Similarly, the recycled asphalt pavement allows contractors to add milled asphalt to new mixes, lowering the asphalt content of the new material, which saves oil, lowers cost, and reduces greenhouse gas emission. Every ton of recycled asphalt from construction, which is the millings that you see the milling machine, uh, results in the elimination of 0.03 tons of CO2 emissions. Some states are resistant to using RAP, and AGC believes incentives would help these states uh, overcome their reluctance. Soil modification is another green practice that we use in the highway business. In many construction situations, on-site soils are not acceptable as sub-base materials. This requires the material to be dug up and replaced. So instead of removing the unsuitable material and putting it somewhere and digging up new suitable material and replacing it, which has caused scars on the land, a variety of additives can be used, cement, lime, fly ash, uh, and other chemicals. And this saves fuel and reduces the elimination uh, emissions by the need to haul things off and haul things back in. And it also helps the traveling public with the decrease in traffic. It's important to note the construction industry is not in itself a significant source of greenhouse gas. According to EPA estimates, equipment used in construction generates only 0.86% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions due to the combustion of fossil fuel. AGC opposes government mandates to modify equipment already in use or to replace such equipment via regulation or contractual requirement. Such re re retroactive re requirements place the financial burden of a largely public benefit exclusively on the private contractor. They also to have the potential to render a company's fleet prematurely obsolete and wipe out its net worth, which is how we are able to bond jobs. However, improvements in greenhouse gas emissions could be achieved by replacing older equipment with newer and more efficient equipment. AGC recommends the creation of an investment tax credit to encourage contractors to replace older equipment with new models. Newer equipment is extremely more energy efficient, it's operator friendly and safe, safer, and the new engines are designed to have a lot lower emissions of uh, particulate matter and NOx. Reducing particulate matter and NOx and black carbon can have a positive impact on global warming. In addition to the environmental benefits from replacing old equipment, there would be an economic benefit as well. With a downturn in the construction, downturn in the construction market, contractors are purchasing less equipment, both for their current workload and the future, because our future market is uncertain. U.S. equipment manufacturers have been forced to lay off a significant number of workers being because of the decrease of new equipment purchases. While the recently enacted stimulus program provides significant infrastructure investment, it does not create the long type of long-term market opportunities until we have a full economic recovery and we see what the new highway bill will be. Uh, a tax credit would offer an incentive for contractors right now to, uh, to buy new equipment. In conclusion, AGC believes that the efforts to further the use of construction techniques and practices that have a positive environmental impact should be encouraged. AGC cautions against creating mandates that attempt to impose specific construction practices. AGC believes that partnership approach will better produce better results for achieving the national goals. Opportunities will be available when surface transportation reauthorization legislation is considered later this year. 
AGC is evaluating proposals thus far, including the Clean Tea Act, and we look forward to working with this committee in the future and trying to enhance our transportation system and our environment. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Our final witness is uh, Mr. Dominic Ricolo, Senior Vice President at John Deere, the green uh, uh, equipment that uh, our friend Mr. Salazar mentioned. He's responsible for sales and marketing in the Worldwide Construction and Forestry Division. He's previously worked in wholesale finance and directed the Hitachi Construction and Mining Division. John Deere is a leading provider of products and services for agriculture and forestry, and we deeply appreciate your joining us today and look forward to your uh, testimony when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of John Deere, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, distinguished members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify today on constructing a green transportation policy. Uh, I'd also like to go on the record for thanking Mr. Salzer for his kind comments about our products and companies as well. For uh, 171 years, John Deere has enabled uh, human flourishing by offering solutions to, to those who produce food, fiber, and fuel, beautify and protect our environment, and build and maintain our homes and critical infrastructure. During this period, Deere has invented, manufactured, and sold worldwide hundreds of models of construction equipment, as well as the engines powering them. Deere created these tools with a consistent purpose, improving productivity and efficiency. Just as productivity and efficiency drive Deere's product innovation, we suggest that it should also drive our nation's infrastructure policy. America's infrastructure directly affects economic, social, and environmental well-being. Every day, we all rely upon our roads, bridges, transit, rail, and other infrastructure to survive and thrive. Despite our dependence on it, the nation has taken infrastructure for granted and permitted it to fail and to disrepair without concern for its sustainability. The nation's current infrastructure has suffered from the absence of a national vision premised on both robust funding as well as the pursuit of the most productive and effective projects. Actions in recent weeks reflect congressional leadership in creating this vision for infrastructure. It is clear you appreciate something as significant as our infrastructure requires significant funding. We also must make sure this and future money is spent wisely, and to do so we need to incorporate principles of environmental sustainability into our infrastructure policy. John Deere believes one way to make infrastructure projects greener is through the use of productive, efficient construction equipment. The construction equipment marketplace has consistently demanded machine productivity and efficiency because fuel consumption is a primary operating cost for our customers. In response, John Deere and other construction equipment manufacturers expend substantial resources to ensure their customers can get the most work out of every gallon of fuel used. The federal government can take many steps to support further efforts in construction equipment industry to improve equipment productivity and efficiency and reduce environmental impacts. Collaboration between the public and private sectors is needed to investigate and fund the research and development of new standards and technologies to further improve equipment productivity and efficiency. By recognizing the essential road, non-road equipment will play in transforming the transportation and other sectors of the economy to achieve ambitious and necessary greenhouse gas reductions, we can see that appropriate investment by the federal government into non-road technologies would create substantial environmental returns. For example, creating modal shifts from the road transport to rail and public transportation systems is one way to help offset the growth, the growth in greenhouse gas emissions. We strongly recommend that the federal government also take steps to ensure construction equipment owners can more easily purchase new technologies that excel in productivity, efficiency, and environmental sustainability, and thereby build infrastructure that the, demand, that the nation demands. A single piece of large construction equipment can cost several hundreds of thousands of dollars. The development of tax incentives and funding specific to the purchase of new equipment will remove uncertainty for equipment owners who today face the risk that inconsistent environmental and other regulations created by states and locally may make equipment obsolete well before the end of its useful life. On a larger scale, the federal government can support greener construction practices and techniques by incorporating environmental considerations into infrastructure planning and funding decisions. As a member of the United States Climate Action Partnership, John Deere supports incorporating greenhouse gas measurement and accounting in transportation, infrastructure funding, and planning. Incorporating such considerations, however, needs to be coupled with an improvement to the infrastructure project development and approval process. Transportation projects often become bogged down for years in inefficient and redundant processes, thereby increasing the project costs and undermining the ability to improve the environmental impact on our transportation system. 
An efficient transportation system also provides many indirect benefits. For example, improving our infrastructure, we will improve the environmental sustainability of many green industries critical to rural America, including renewable energy specifically. I'd like to especially thank committee member Hersa Sandlin for her support of Woody Biomass Energy. Woody Biomass is a prime example of rural renewable resources that can help meet our energy needs, address the challenges of climate change, revitalize our rural communities, and improve the health of forests. Congress is in a position to unlock the enormous potential of Woody Biomass by supporting not only the creation of a market for it, but also the creation of an infrastructure system that enables its ready and cost-effective transportation. In concluding my remarks, I would be remiss if I failed to mention another critical benefit Congress should consider in its infrastructure policy debate, and that's to one of job creation. John Deere witnesses firsthand a dramatic impact of the current financial crisis on its workforce, dealers, and customers. The financial crisis has hit the construction industry very hard, with 21.4 percent unemployment and over 2 million construction workers without jobs. The impact of the financial crisis extends well beyond the construction industry to those skilled and hardworking Americans who manufacture our vital construction equipment. John Deere and others in the construction equipment industry have been forced to lay off many employees as a result of the plunging demand for construction equipment caused by the financial crisis. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Super. Thank you very much. Ms. Hersa Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. Um, Mr. Ricolo, thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, thank the other witnesses as well. Uh, but my questions uh, go to you uh, as it relates to uh, the Renewable Biofuels Facilitation Act. I appreciate uh, John Deere's support of this legislation that I've reintroduced with Mr. Greg Walden of Oregon. Um, we believe that a key to fulfilling the renewable fuels standard that we passed in 2007 is to ensure that cellulosic biofuels can be produced from the greatest possible diversity of feedstocks in communities across the nation. This particularly affects any region of the country with significant tracts of forest land, as you indicated, including the Midwest, the Northwest, the Northeast, and the South. Now, I know your company has developed specialized equipment to collect woody biomass in forests, and I hope that you can share more uh, about that with the committee. But I also know that the company has been very active in South Dakota in testing new farm machinery that's going to make it easier to uh, gather for producers, agricultural producers, to gather uh, and process corn stover and other farm byproducts that can be used for cellulosic ethanol production. So if you could expand on those initiatives and elaborate on the necessity of these projects if we're going to have greener fuel sources uh, in the future, and if you could also speak to some of the challenges you're currently facing as you assist efforts to expand the diversity of feedstocks for biofuels. Certainly, I'll, I'll try to hit on all those. I think there was a number of topics in, in your in your question, and be glad to to address that. Uh, relative to uh, woody biomass, yes, we we do have uh, uh, product, and essentially referred to as an energy bundler, if you will. It it uh, goes about collecting uh, residue off the forest floors, if you will. Uh, either after a, a logging operation or just that it, it naturally exists and uh, actually promotes uh, the uh, health of the forest, if you will, uh, also reduces certain risks, as you know, as forest fires, uh, and, and essentially takes this residue and, and compresses it in a way that, uh, that creates uh, uh, kind of bundles of, of, uh, of material that can be used in cogen plants and so on as an alternative form of, of, uh, of energy and certainly one that's, uh, that's renewable. Uh, so on the forestry front, uh, that, that is uh, uh, the, the purpose of, of the uh, wood biomass in particular. Um, in terms of, of uh, biomass that comes from, from uh, either corn stover or other forms of uh, agricultural products, we have several uh, projects underway there. Uh, in terms of, of really uh, developing uh, the technologies associated with turning uh, agricultural residue, if you will, into other forms of energy, be it uh, uh, fuels or, or otherwise. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being with the Construction and Forestry Division, uh, not the expert necessarily on agricultural uh, uh, biomass efforts, uh, but uh, would certainly, if there's more specific questions, more than glad to take those questions back and, and get back to the committee with, uh, with those specific answers. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, and also, for the record, just as Mr. Salazar mentioned his familiarity with John Deere's equipment, I, too, spent many hours of my youth uh, <laughs> on the green machines uh, <laughs> there on the family farm. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you to thank you. our entire panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, I would – we're reaching the wrap-up here, but I, I would like to uh, pose to each of our panelists uh, an opportunity to maybe drill down for a moment about the incentives, uh, the government standards that were referenced, uh, and opportunities to change the process. Part of what we've heard from our witnesses uh, so far is a little frustration um, at a time when uh, it can get a little complex. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman referenced his um, uh, frustration with not being able to, to actually get a project through the federal process, uh, which ends up uh, providing delay, driving up costs. Uh, Mr. Weaver, I think you, you referenced it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you would like to just start at first talking about what the government specs should be how the federal government, we're dealing with reauthorization now of the Surface Transportation Act, which expires uh, in six months and I think will be reauthorized by this Congress. Um, if you want us to touch on how specifically you think we can help by driving some different standards and opportunities, not just for pilot projects, but maybe something that's performance based that would enable us to make it easier uh, to. Uh, use the new processes that you reference uh, and to make it easier to not have to jump through hurdles to be able to uh, uh, incent some of the state or local governments to take some of the innovations not just to be able to recycle but you're saving landfill and energy. Um, I want to take a just sort of each panelist make a brief comment about the specification issue. Well, thank you for the question and uh, it's certainly a complex issue the, um, that this legislation will be addressing on greenhouse gases. And I think uh, uh, one of the, the first points is to look at this uh, legislation in a holistic way and really trying to link, in our case, uh, the, you know, the intensity of cement on producing greenhouse gases, but with the benefits of concrete as an eco-efficient material in, w when it comes to uh, highway infrastructure. Um, in terms of the specs, I think there's there's a lot that uh, government, federal government, can do in terms. Uh, there are there are specs for uh, blended cements or or performance based uh, uh, the standards. Uh, the problem is that they're not utilized across the board. There are only a, a handful of states that really rec that recommend on their projects these performance based standards. So I think there's an opportunity to mitigate the impact of uh, greenhouse gases by the usage of blended cements if it's a federal um, a mandate for uh, a, a, bl a performance based standard rather than just a recipe or a prescription of uh, cement. We, we don't need the same uh, cement on our uh, strength on our driveways that we need on our highways. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will drive a lot of innovation on uh, on our industry and uh, in the entire sector. Mr. Weaver. Yes, I would like to see the Department of Transportation coordinate across all of their uh, entities: Federal Transit, Federal Highways, FAA, their specifications uh, to be a little more uniform on the use of recycled material and uh, uh, locally available material, rather than inspecting some exotic things uh, that have to be mm -hmm. transported great distances. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, like the FAA specs and the Federal Highway specs are totally different. And uh, according to her, uh, the minimum cement content at the end result spec, if let us do our own mixed designs on asphalt, concrete, uh, we got to guarantee it. Uh, let us come up with what we think will work and prove it rather than the state or the federal agency telling us what we have to use. But making it performance based, as long as it does end result, the job. Yeah, yeah, I'd rather call it end result rather than performance. But but uh, end result, they want 3,500 pound concrete that's going to last 50 years. Instead of telling us how much cement to put in it, we can substitute maybe some rock or sand, some locally available materials, and and make it denser and, and better than uh, than what they specify. Thank you. 
Um, getting back to the, the part of your question in terms of maybe some of the frustration you sensed here, especially in terms of the creation of incentives or uh, some of the uh, inconsistencies and in regulations from state to state or municipality to municipality when it comes to to uh, to uh, some of the uh, requirements associated with, with equipment. I think one, one of the things is that uh, there has been some consistency in terms of what the EPA has come out with, where, where it kind of gets uh, extrapolated, if you will, at the state or local level, I think is what causes a lot of the, the uncertainty that, uh, that Mr. Weaver expressed as well in his, uh, in his uh, opening statements. And I think uh, that into itself, finding some mechanisms that, that do incentivize uh, construction contractors, if you will, construction equipment uh, owners, to, uh, to uh, acquire new pieces that will uh, move the needle, if you will, relative to greenhouse gas and emissions uh, and, and remove some of the fear in terms of obsolescence uh, that, that a lot of these new regulations are causing, I think is, is one that, that would be a great step forward uh, going for, moving forward mm -hmm. uh, and uh, relative to the, uh, the highway bill in particular uh, and the whole topic of infrastructure and where do we take the infrastructure going forward uh, for the nation uh, is certainly one that is, is complex. And I think and the previous panel hit on a few issues of where it has to be balanced. Uh, the infrastructure requirements in rural America are certainly different than they are in, in more urban areas. And uh, it is going to be certainly a difficult task in terms of achieving a balanced uh, approach that addresses uh, and at least touches on the needs of, of, of all Americans. Super. Well, let me just. Um, express my deep appreciation for uh, your patience here with us today and laying out um, a very strong case for an element that doesn't get appropriate attention in our uh, climate change discussion. Um, uh, a ton of uh, carbon uh, being generated by a, uh, uh, to create a, a ton of uh, concrete is, is, is something that uh, I think people find sort of staggering if they're not uh, equipped with it. And I have been very impressed with what your industry has done to try and uh, develop uh, a, glean, a, a, a greener, uh, lighter carbon footprint. And uh, the uh, construction industry, uh, the leadership that's being exhibited at some of the state and local level is really uh, remarkable. And uh, your point about equipment manufacturing, which is essential to all of this, we've got a lot of, of equipment out there that uh, actually does generate a tremendous amount of pollution and is inefficient, but as uh, Mr. Weaver points out, is uh, an important part of the net worth of a lot of uh, small and medium-sized business people, and they're going to need some, some help in the transition. And I think across the board, you are uncovering uh, a series of elements that are very, very important for us to consider in climate change, in reauthorization, um, in what's going to happen in the next round of economic stimulus, because I don't think the economy is going to rebound uh, quickly, uh, and transportation finance. So you've really set the table here in an underappreciated part of the committee's work, and I appreciate deeply your helping us build the record here today. And I wonder if we haven't exhausted your time and patience, if uh, each of you might have um, a minute uh, that you would like to offer up to just kind of punctuate uh, one item as we conclude the hearing. I guess just to um, reiterate that uh, the energy intensive part and the, the ton of, uh, of uh, CO2 generated in, uh, in cement, it can really uh, be offset by all the benefits of concrete usage. It's cement, the, the energy intensive product, but it's only 15% of concrete. So there's a lot of opportunities to uh, really work on both ways to reduce uh, our carbon footprint. Super. I'm going to help Mr. John Deere. Uh, we think that an incentive, a uh, tax incentive, uh, whether it's a targeted tax credit or whatever, to replace new equipment. With the money flowing to the states now to rebuild the highways, a lot of contractors will take old equipment. As I did this winter, I rebuilt a 24-year-old piece of equipment, and I didn't bring it up to current standards, but it's going to be good enough to last another 10 or 12 years. Had there been some kind of incentive mm -hmm. there, I wouldn't have rebuilt that. I would have went and bought a new yes. motor grader for 300000 But uh, this money's coming, and I think it's time that, that people uh, have a plan to replace their older equipment. And on a personal note, Little Rock has over 60 miles of bicycle pedestrian trail starting at the Clinton Library. And uh, the centerpiece of it is uh, the longest pedestrian bicycle bridge in the United States. 
and excuse me, but it's named the Big Damn Bridge. <laughs> it, it goes over a dam. Yes, and, and Congressman Snyder uh, is uh, shamelessly promoting it. That along with your streetcar. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, I'd just like to conclude by just saying the uh, topic of infrastructure spending uh, is, is a tough one. It is one that is extremely expensive. Uh, we fully understand and appreciate one. But we also, uh, I, I think, uh, all need to come to realization the cost of, or the failure to do so uh, has got a tremendous cost as well that, that maybe is not uh, one that can be as easily defined, if you will. Um, to uh, uh, Congressman Salazar's initial question about uh, cap and trade or uh, uh, just to share Deere's view on, on that, uh, our view is we're very much in favor of a, a cap and trade uh, system uh, for the simple reasons that it, it uh, A, uh, allows for greater flexibility, but I think will drive uh, greater innovation and get us uh, to uh, the kinds of uh, greenhouse uh, gas levels that, that are, uh, are going to be necessary going forward. Wow. Well, that's, that's a great note uh, to, on which to conclude the hearing. For the last 30 months, I've been having conversations with a variety of stakeholders, including representatives of each of your industries, about how we should be rebuilding and renewing America, what sort of vision we have going forward, not just another transportation bill, but the big picture that each of you have referenced. And I must say that meeting with 250 stakeholders now over two and a half years, um, and having a series of uh, conferences around the country. We'll be in Atlanta uh, again this Monday. I am struck by the pockets of innovation that people aren't aware of, the flexibility that is uh, not maybe necessarily um, associated with various sectors of the economy um, and the potential of bringing people together. You may have noticed that occasionally it's a little controversial around here. There's a little controversy, a little debate. Uh, but what we're seeing, starting at the grassroots and as evidenced by your testimony today, that there's, there are broad areas of consensus that can bring people together to help solve economic problems, saving the planet, and making the quality of life uh, improve for all Americans. And we really appreciate your contributions for advancing that debate and look forward to working with you and the committee as we move forward. Thank you very much. And I think we are adjourned.